with us uh, at Spa. Mika Hakkinen, the winner here. David Coulthard, his uh, McLaren teammate in fourth. And David joins us right now. David, um, definitely not the result you wanted. You really wanted more than fourth this afternoon, didn't you? Yeah, absolutely. You know, to, to keep in there with the hunt for the championship, I've got to be scoring more points and obviously make it difficult for myself, uh, not qualifying uh, as well as I would have liked. But I'm trying to understand exactly what we were doing at the pit stop because obviously I, I lost a lot of place there and that put me out behind French in which um, I'm not sure how many seconds I lost there, but it was a good second for each lap I was behind him. And, you know, even one extra point would have been good today. That's happened to you a little bit before, hasn't it? One or two, you've come out worse on sort of pit stop strategy. Can you throw any light on what, or any more light on why that did happen again today? I, I can't really until I, until I talk to the team. You know, obviously when I saw Michael pit, then I started a conversation as to whether it was the right time or not. And uh, you, you take it as read that, that uh, the team are going to look at the sector times and advise as best they can what would be the, the thing to do. And now obviously Mika decided to pit the next lap given how far back I was, then I think there's a possibility that I could have pitted that lap as well. And even if I had to queue up slightly, I would have lost less, less time than I lost obviously doing the complete lap. So there's things like that, I think, that, to be honest, as a team we need to sharpen up on. And uh, obviously, from one point of view, from Mika's point of view, then it was a perfect race. But, you know, I want to, I want to get more out of my races, and the last few have not been good enough. Uh, we reckon you lost anything between 30 and 40 seconds on, on that particular manoeuvre, David. How would you sum up now the rest of the season from your point of view? I suppose the big question everybody back home is going to be asking is, are you still chasing the world title? I am, but obviously now it's, it's getting further away because uh, if all cars are finishing races, then you know, I don't know the exact maths, but I guess I've got to win the next three races, the uh, next four races, and um, you know, that's going to be difficult against the competition. But uh, a lot of things can happen. You know, reliability obviously is, is a factor which can win you back a lot of points. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm definitely not going to give up on that dream until uh, the points don't add up. It is a dream for you. Do you think reality might set in and that perhaps your team boss, Ron Dennis, next week will say, well, David, now again you have to support Mika Hakkinen's charge? No, I don't. Okay, let's just talk about the start, can we, David? Because there was a lot of confusion around at the start. And were you one of the drivers who wanted the start to be behind the safety car? Because it did you no favours as well, didn't it? Yeah, obviously it took away the opportunity to overtake, but it also took away the, the potential for an incident. And I know there'll be a debate over it, but the fact is I was, I was asked beforehand and I said that based on the, the previous years we've had here, the safest thing is to have a safety car start. You know, you can you can have the have a go heroes into the first corner, and your your whole weekend ruined. So, I'd rather be finishing fourth than uh, than going out at the first corner. So, I think in in this this situation, based on the experience here of the past few years, I think Charlie made the right decision. And do you think that was the feeling of most of the drivers down there? I believe he was going to ask the other two directors of the GPDA, and if there was a unanimous decision, that's what he would do. So, I presume Michael and Alex said the same as I did, and then uh, the others who don't put as much effort and don't get a say. Good. Uh, just before you go, I think I think Tony wants a word with you, Tony. Well, it was really just to follow up on that start, um, because as Martin was saying on the commentary there, David, as well, it wasn't that wet at all. And I just wondered why it was a decision of all the drivers normally when it's, it's just confined to the FIA who make that decision and you have to go out and get on with it. Because you, um, along with a lot of other drivers, were disadvantaged. I, I didn't hear the last part of your sentence there, but I think that... Uh, the, the bottom line is we've seen a number of incidents here over the last few years when we've had wet starts, cars going out at the first corner. Surely for everyone it's got to be better to, to see all the cars uh, making around the first lap and then a race from there. Obviously it takes away that excitement that everyone tunes in for that first five minutes of a Grand Prix and then they probably tune off until the pit stops. But, uh, you know, you have to make a decision and I think this was a smart decision based on the experience of this race. So we just have to accept it as it was and um, another circuit may have been a different decision. OK, David, we appreciate not uh, the best day you've had at work in the year 2000. We appreciate you joining us, as you have done. Thanks very much yeah, indeed. Thanks. OK, well, Martin with us. Martin, let's talk about uh, the start. Um, David adopted the party liner that most of the drivers seem to be saying to you before. It's like, yeah, we prefer the safety car, but it deprived us of a great spectacle. And listen to you in commentary. You didn't agree with it, did you? No, it's clear to me the track was not wet enough for the safe to be necessary for the safety car. I understand their concerns. Nobody wants drivers killed. I mean, it, it's amazing. A couple of years ago, when we had that huge accident there that somebody wasn't badly injured or killed. I accept that. But this is a dangerous sport, you know. It says so on the back of the tickets, as Bernie Eccleston will tell you. And that track, you can see it there for yourselves, does not need a safety car uh, at all. 
Uh, there was a bit of spray when they got it. I, I know, it's terrifying. You can't even see your own steering wheel when you're going up the back straight. But it's part and parcel of Grand Prix racing. You've got to cope with all of the elements. You've got to take the risks. And you've got to make the best of, you know, all of the conditions. You're really saying, though, that if you'd have been among that lot today, you'd have been the one who'd have said, I want this race to start properly. I started this race a dozen times, and I bet at least half a dozen of those times was in the pouring rain. It's what you do. You're a Grand Prix driver. You drive Grand Prix. Can I just say something else, Jim? And, and I can go back to 96 here, and Martin was driving the Jordan in Brazil before the start of the race. It deluged. It was literally a lake. And they asked Martin to go out and take the car out, and there was a bow wave came up over the front of the car. You know, that's the sort of testing of the conditions beforehand. And if you take 97 here, it deluged 20 minutes before the start, and it started behind the safety car. That was fair enough, but those conditions did not warrant it, and I believe it was decision of the FIA. It's like all the Manchester United players getting around the referee and barricading him on the pitch or, or on, on the circuit, say, hey, 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 let's go, we've got to go behind the safety car. I'm sorry, that's, that's not how it should have been. And if you come to Spa, which is the most daunting and difficult of tracks, it is part of it. It's part of a Grand Prix driver's skill to make the start, and it goes with the territory here at Spa-Francorchamps. The bottom line is going to David, who we've just spoken to. He needed something extra special at the start, and that was denied him. Yes, it was, but as David pointed out, it could have gone either way. He could have made up a place, or he could have had a have-a-go hero, as he puts it, uh, running into him. So, um, you know, the people most advantaged were at the sharp end of the grid, and the people most disadvantaged were at the back end of the grid. But I have to say, I mean, Gerhard Berger said to me on the line, I'm really pleased I'm not driving this Grand Prix today. He said, I wouldn't want to be driving this Grand Prix. I mean, as it happens, I would have. But, uh, you know, it, once you get that first lap out of the way, it calms down a bit. So drive sensibly. Yeah, strange that we had a dry race as well throughout. What about uh, Jensen Button here, here, Martin? I would think he's quite chuffed that he drove the race today. He drove a good race today. We saw him have a bad half lap, yeah. really. He, he totally went the wrong side of uh, truly there trying to get through. He, he sort of tucked himself up in, a, in an area where he was never going to get through, and Schumacher then leapt over him instead. I think Jensen probably felt annoyed about that, of it and uh, tried to make it all up in the very next corner and he's a long way behind look at this stage of the Jordan and the uh, Jordan having to get off the brake but that, that was always going to end up in tears fortunately for Jensen not his tears but it did cost him quite dearly in the race and that that wasn't the smartest move I've seen him do behind the wheel of a Grand Prix car but I'm um, supersonic impressed he was up there to do it in the first place we had uh, Eddie Jordan sitting in doing saying that Sir Frank Williams must be crackers, <laughs> letting, letting him go. Um, I don't know what Eddie might say to him after what he did to his man Trulli there, though. Well, no, perhaps he'd have a different view on it. But, but when he analyses it in complete, looking at the race in totality, you see that at least Jensen Button is prepared to have a go. Because this mm. Briatore said, like, I'm signing this guy, he's very good. The one thing he lacks is aggression. With experience, he's going to learn that. And he had a go today, and we've seen him in the wet and the dry at Spa, and he's been great. Okay. He made a mistake there, but truly let him off afterwards. He said, well, okay, you know, it's a mistake that happens. And he still got the thing through to fifth place. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, the guy's a real star. Mika Hakkinen won this race despite spinning off, and, and um, we didn't actually see the spin in, in, in great detail, but he's done really, really well to recover from it and come through and win. Yeah, you summed it up, he won the race, literally. I mean, he went out there and took the race back. He'd given it away with that spin. The Belgian TV guys sort of missed the key moment. They've got the end of it, look. But uh, a bit of a half spin, really, there from Mika. Front brakes on, front end comes back on the wet grass, and off he goes. But there's Michael Schumacher going through to take the lead. And the next sector of the race, Mika really looked like he'd blown it. He didn't have the speed, he couldn't respond. We know he had a heavier fuel load now than Michael Schumacher because he pitted uh, a while later. Um, but really, Michael seemed to have the legs by a long way, one second a lap sometimes on, on Mika. After the second stop, Mika just got a second breath, didn't he? How, and, do, how do you explain that? How, how come he was so much quicker after the second stop and made up all that ground on Michael Schumacher? I think it's a combination of probably the tyres felt a little bit better to him. The, drag, the track was virtually bone dry then. And I think he just gritted his teeth and went for it, frankly. He, wa he wanted that race win, didn't he? Mm, he did. Um, David Coulthard had troubles getting past Heinz Howard Frenson, didn't he? And finally managed it um, on, on a pit stop. 
Tony, but it, this was never really going to be David's day, though, was it? No, because he'd been stuck behind him because, you know, he'd had to wait and go around that extra lap to come in. But this is where, you know, it was the McLaren guys against the Jordan guys. And, of course, it's Coulthard against Heinz Harold Frenson. We've already had this spat in qualifying where they'd actually ruined each other's qualifying session. But, you know, the McLaren guys, Michael Negline, the chief mechanic, and the guys from Oakland got him out just ahead of Heinz Harold Frenson. Um, and, and it was important because DC's not out of it altogether yet, and at least he was able to salvage some points. Frenson apparently didn't, didn't get on, on the right spot there, did he? But I mean, just going back to what really cost David so dearly, the, the, the mess up, you can't describe that when he had to do, do the extra lap. I and mean, um, what's your best guess about that? I mean, will there be meetings about that? And will McLaren say, well, perhaps we didn't play fair by him? No, I think they just didn't do it very well. But in a way, also, David's got to take command of the situation. I mean, Lacey pitted even a lap earlier. The Ferrari were mm. responding to Lacey's section times, in my view. And if David felt it was ready for slicks, he should have made the call, should have come in. I lost the Grand Prix here in 92 because I believed it was the right time to come in. Michael Schumacher went off in front of me and I decided to wait one more lap. Michael saw my tyres, came in and he won the race. But you've got to have the courage of your convictions. And it's, I think they should have called him in on the same lap as Hackner. I said it on the commentary, 17.4 sure. seconds. We know they stop for no longer than 11. So quite clearly he's going to be coming into the garage six seconds after Mick has left. They've got to get his tyres out and his fuel rig ready, but if it costs them another three or four seconds, that's the absolute maximum. You're always a believe in that, almost queuing, almost queuing I don't think they it. would have queued. His, his Mika was never going to be stationary for 17 seconds. They would not have queued. Same as Hockenheim, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I, I really... queuing would have been uh, better. And what surprises me is if it's so clear for, for us up in the comedy box to say that, I can't understand why it's not clear for others to see it too. They had a good... Uh, two British drivers had a terrific scrap during what was a very eventful Grand Prix, wasn't it? Um, yeah. Coulthard, uh, Coulthard and Button and... Uh, well, Jensen held him back for a while, but had to give way in well, the end. Well, I mean, this is this is a little bit of a, a rerun, the end of Hockenheim, because if you remember, Jensen Button was coming to the field. He closed in on David Coulthard, but this time, coming up to Lake Coombe, you know, over 200 miles an hour superiority there, and, and through comes uh, Coulthard uh, to take the fourth place. But, but it's nice to see the two of them together. Nice, clean manoeuvre as well. The great thing is, I think the older drivers as well can trust Jensen Button. From very early on, they've learned this guy's good, his track craft is good, and they're prepared you know, to, to let him have a go. They, they don't think he's dangerous, do they? No, in fact, when we were doing the track guide earlier on in the weekend with Jock Clear, Villeneuve's engineer, he was saying to me, Villeneuve has a lot of respect for Button because he's tough on the track, but he, but he plays fair as well. And uh, you know, it's unusual for Jacques Villeneuve to say, say something positive about another <laughs> driver, <laughs> put it that way. Yeah, yeah I think, I think we'll all endorse that up here anyway. Anyway, occasionally here we say, well, the big two, they never actually fight it out, they never go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, eyeball to eyeball. But I think when we look back at this um, Belgian Grand Prix, we will remember this scrap between... Yeah, Schumacher this, was, this was opportunist from Hacken and Hare using the back marker. I thought he would need the back marker in Eau Rouge, but we know he had... Well, this is the early one, actually, the first time he tried to get through, and Michael uh, really closing the door quite nicely, a touch late, but very effectively, let's say. And now, second opportunity, we know that Hacken has got 10 kilometres an hour more uh, in a straight line, plus the toe on that occasion. And Michael will be very surprised to see Mika coming round the other side. I don't know why Michael elected to go the long way round Zonta at that point. It was totally opportunistic, and you have to say, a mistake there from Michael. That was a, that was a Schumacher area, you'd say, would you? I think, yes, by leaving the door open on the inside like that, um, he, he quite clearly offered Mika the short way around. And there's a lot of grip, everybody knows. There's superb grip of the inside into Le Coombe. You can really break late there. Well, I hope they're going to ask uh, Michael Schumacher about that when uh, they go to the press conference. We will be joining that press conference when you rejoin us. OK, then, let's hear what uh, the big three have got to say in the press conference. The two Schumachers are there, and so is the winner of the Belgian Grand Prix, Mika Hakkinen. Mika. Confirmation of the standings for you. Hakkinen, 74. Michael Schumacher, 68. David Coulthard, 61. Barrichello, 49. Ralph Schumacher, 20. Fisichella, 18. And uh, Mercedes McLaren, 125. Ferrari, 117. The big two BMW looking good for that third place. 
Let's have a word with Jensen Button. Started third, finished fifth. Here he is chatting to James Allen. Jensen Button, what an amazing day. First of all, you started in third place and you were very dynamic at the start. Uh, yeah, we were. the car was working well at the beginning. I tried to get the inside of Truly into the, the first corner. I think it was on the second or third lap and it just didn't happen. Um, we collided and that's how I dropped back to fifth, I think. But uh, all round, it's good to get some points, but uh, a bit disappointing. You seem a bit disappointed because obviously you were, you were looking at trying to win this race, weren't you? Uh, I don't know about win it, but uh, it would have been nice to be in the top three. But there you go. Uh, hopefully next time. Was it very, very different when the conditions changed to full dry? Were you able to keep the pace? Yeah, it was very, very different, obviously. It was from wet to dry. Um, it was very difficult to know when to do the pit stop also. I think we were uh, a bit late, but uh, all round, it's not too bad. Got some points and uh, I think I'm very, cl near, very close to Jack now in the champ, so it's good. Not too bad. He's had a belting weekend. OK, let's uh, just sum it all up, uh, shall we? Tony Jardine, you first. Well, I mean, Bruce McLaren won first here for McLaren in 68. It's the first time for Hacken, looking very, very strong. But uh, it is now Krauss's time at Ferrari. Monza is next, and they've got to try and prevent a riot in red, I'm afraid. Interesting hearing Michael Schumacher admitting they're saying they were just too quick here. Yeah, but it was fascinating also to hear him say, my team told me that he was much faster than me down the straight. There's a lot of information passed between Schumacher and his team. I think that's why he's so smart during the race. I mean, effectively... He was much closer to winning this race today than we thought he would be after free practice and, and qualifying. And we know he's good at Monza. We know he's good in Japan and Malaysia. Uh, Indianapolis is a complete unknown to anybody. So I think he's right to say I'm not out of this yet. But Mika Hakkinen, I mean, that's now 42 points out of 50 Amazing. in the last five races. OK, thank you very much uh, to you both. And uh, as Martin has just said there, yeah, next we go to Monza for the Italian Grand Prix, the full ITV service in a couple of weeks' time. Of course, highlights tonight at 11.15, ITV 2 tomorrow at 7, and then off we go to Monza, qualifying live 11.30 on the Saturday, the race live at 12.15. Well, the hack attack continues. Mika Hakkinen has won in Belgium for the first time, thanks to a brilliant late manoeuvre, overtaking the Spa Master, Michael Schumacher. See you in a couple of weeks. Bye-bye.